So as I said, I'm going to focus on the knee, hip, and sacroiliac joint. Uh, as already alluded to from Dr. DePinto's lecture, the lesion volume is different with traditional thermal radiofrequency ablation. So as you can see here in the picture in the upper right-hand corner, you have an elliptoid uh, lesion, which basically extends from the tip uh, to the base of the insulation here. So it's basically the length of the active tip, and then you create this elliptoid uh, ablative pattern. And generally, your temperatures are getting up to 80, 85 degrees centigrade. Uh, and then if you compare the same gauge, because gauge makes a difference as far as your lesion, both 18 gauge needles here, and you do cooled thermal radiofrequency ablation, uh, you can see that the, the lesion size is larger. Uh, there's a distal projection from beyond the tip outwards. Um, and you can estimate about a five millimeter radius around, OK? Uh, one of the things that, if you didn't already know, uh, I'll let you know, cooled is not cold. It's not cryo. There's a lot of confusion with all of this. So that's why I write in thermal anytime I talk about cooled radiofrequency ablation, because guess what? Insurance companies will read cooled, and they'll think it's cryo. Or you talk to your patients, and they think it's like freezing laser beams and things. So uh, the nomenclature is a little bit confusing. So try to remind everyone you're actually doing a thermal radiofrequency ablation, even though the term cooled is in there. The cool, as Mario mentioned, refers to the circulation of an isotonic fluid uh, that allows the dissipation of thermal energy throughout the tissue. Uh, it also serves to protect other structures, which may be in the lesioning field, like vascular structures. So we'll start out talking about the knee. Um, so these are the genicular uh, cooled radiofrequency ablation. Genu is also knee, uh, I believe in Latin. I can't remember if it's Latin or Greek, but I think it's Latin. Um, so we'll talk about the diagnostic blocks. Uh, basically, we, we take the knee, we put it into a neutral position with uh, a pillow or towels underneath. It's slightly flexed. Uh, the reason we do that on the table is just so when we do our laterals, we know which knee we're dealing with. If you leave the knee flat and you go to a lateral, you're going to see both knees. You're not going to know what you're dealing with. Uh, the yellow circles are, are targets uh, for the genicular nerves. And as you can see from this cadaveric study, what they did is they just took, found those genicular nerves by gross dissection, put in wires, and then fluoroscopically took an image to give you a sense of what we're dealing with. That is why our targets are the junction between the diaphysis, or shaft, and the condyle. So right along this inflection point here, here, and here is really our target for cooled radiofrequency ablation. As you notice, we do not do the lateral inferior uh, location because the common peroneal nerve is right there. And we would then get a foot drop. So really, your, your three primary locations are here, here, and here. We do sometimes add a fourth needle for subbatellar pain. So the an anterior cutaneous or anterior branch of the femoral nerve as it comes right down into the patella, you can address with a lesion right at about 8 centimeters proximal from the distal end of the femur uh, right at midline. So for the procedure itself, uh, you know, anesthetize with buffered 2% lidocaine. Uh, we use a 20, I use a 25 gauge, either 2.5 or 3.5 inch needle. Um, we get down until we're basically periosteal. And then we check a lateral to make sure we're 50% across the diaphysis. And we inject 1 milliliter of 0 0.5, even 0.75% bupivacaine. And then we want to tell our patients, we want you to walk. We want you to move. Do not go home and rest. Keep a log. I give them a journal uh, that has the times every hour afterwards for the remainder of their day, um, particularly if you're seeing a lot of geriatric patients, which I do. Um, it's very important you get this log down. Um, then, if you see at least a 50% reduction in their pain, you have achieved a diagnostic success, and you can therefore move forward with your cooled radiofrequency ablation. So basically, the, the needle positions and locations are the exact same, but now you are working with a little bit larger of a needle, um, which we'll pass around here. Mind if I take these? Um, Maybe we'll also show you the 
20 gauge needles. So here's some models of the lesion sizes with these needles, but you get a sense of the gauge, so I'll pass these around. Um, these are diamond tipped needles. Uh, they're not a quinky, uh, they're not a sprot. So what's kind of interesting is, even though they're a larger uh, needle diameter, uh, sometimes you may need to rotate as you enter through tissue. Um, it's a good idea to be generous with your local anesthetic because this can be painful, especially as you get near periosteum. So you can see we start out with the AP. Our needles are trying to get into this, these junction points here, here, and here. We start to get close to periosteum, and we want our needle tips to be just beyond 50% because when we put our probes in, you'll see a radiopaque marker about yay or, and yay here, which is 50% across the diaphysis. So that gives you a sense of what it looks like as a, pho a photograph. And not only can you do it for primary osteoarthritis, which received that indication recently, um, one of the common reasons to do it is for post-arthroplasty pain syndrome. Uh, when I first started doing this, my huge referral source was UCSF knee surgeons where the patients were deemed to be stable as far as the, their mechanical work no infection, but they continued to have pain, which can affect up to 20% of post-arthroplasty pain patients, or post-arthroplasty patients. So uh, what are your options? Meds, reoperate, or this, potentially. Uh, it's been a huge success. Uh, it's really addressed a lot of the neuropathic uh, pain because there's a true lesion of that peripheral nerve um, around that surgical site, and so you can address it with this cooled radiofrequency technique. Uh, as I've already mentioned, do not block that inferior lateral geniculate nerve. Um, it'll cause that peroneal, uh, common peroneal uh, nerve palsy. Uh, you do perform motor testing before you inject any local anesthetic when you're doing the procedure. Uh, you want to make sure you don't go too far in the AP view. And if your needle is too superficial, like the active tip is visible, you can char the subcutaneous tissue. So particularly in the tibial uh, location, you have a very slim 90-year-old lady, you need to make sure your active tip is well underneath the subcutaneous tissue because if you lesion, it may create an eschar. One of the common mistakes you'll see is that the condyles are not lined up. So basically, you want to see an eclipse of the condyles. So make sure you wag correctly. And there is plenty of literature to support it. Um, I'll say the Choi article in pain in 2011 was when I was a fellow, and that really tipped me off to this. Uh, and that's when I really went full court press on getting this machine for us, even though that particular study wasn't done with cooled RF. The idea of having a larger lesion size for what could be a variable course of that genicular nerve appealed to me. Um, and so that's why I've been kind of an early adopter in this whole technology. And we have more and more literature, which you can pull up later. You can email me if you want some of these articles. Uh, this just came out uh, from Tim Davis uh, comparing uh, cooled radiofrequency genicular nerve ablation versus our common treatment of an intraarticular steroid injection. Um, and what's most notable is not only do you see uh, more success, i.e. a greater than 50% reduction in relief with a cooled radiofrequency procedure, as compared to intraarticular steroid injection, look how many patients actually do worse after an intraarticular steroid injection. So you're actually harming patients uh, when you're doing intraarticular steroids, and you really do not with cooled RF. Nobody did worse in this group. Um, so that came out in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine this month. I encourage you to check it out. Um, so that's some of our best uh, evidence, which is really turning the heads of orthopedic surgeons. Um, so again, in my practice, now these guys are like, whoa. Uh, you can do all these procedures for these guys, so they're very interested in this. Um, any questions about the knee? Yes, Roger. The recent data, including the Yeah. There has been some talk about the future about the knee that one Yeah, so I think, oops, sorry. I think it's important for right now, early on, to do that diagnostic block. You don't want to start lesioning necessarily without having that information in your hand. Um, now, with that said, have I had a failed diagnostic block yet? No. 
So I can understand why people would say, do we need a diagnostic block if 100% of the time you're moving on to cool radio frequency ablation? It just takes that one, though, where you know, it was unnecessary or you caused a motor neuropathy for some reason. That really worries me. So for right now, I'm just erring on the side of caution where I'm still going to do a diagnostic block before I start doing a neuroablative procedure. That's just going to be my practice. Yeah, and, and they did, they did uh, functional testing, like, right there, whereas, you know, I'm, I'm not going to hang out with my patients for four hours after we do it. So um, I do rely on their self-report. So um, right now it's that 50% reduction in pain, and then we also look at functional, yeah. So I'm using a longer-acting local anesthetic. Uh, I am not doing the short-acting just in the clinic like the Choi paper did. So... Uh, yeah, it is any point during that day, at least a 50% reduction. And I'm encouraging them to try to be more functional, whether that's doing more stairs or walking a longer distance uh, or doing a certain activity that they enjoy doing, like gardening or washing the dishes or whatever else, like standing up that might ail them. Are you doing most of these pre or post Both. So initially... Uh, you know, I, I wanted to appease the surgeons, so I just said, give me all of your patients you hate. Give me all those patients. Post-arthroplasty is what I generally saw. And then uh, they started seeing decent results, so I started then seeing more AVN or non-surgical candidates or really geriatric patients who were not surgical candidates. And now I'm seeing a ton of, hey, Ramo, I've got a patient who is on opioids, and I think they're a higher risk for surgery. Can you do this beforehand? Absolutely. So um, Walega at a Northwestern will have a study looking at preoperative cool rate of frequency ablation of the geniculars before arthroplasty, looking at pain scores, opioid consumption. And I think the early uh, sentiment is that you're seeing improvements in, in satisfaction and decreased opioid consumption perioperatively, which makes total sense. I think uh, we can encroach on regional anesthesia. As much as I love regional anesthesia, I think interventional pain can actually be used preoperatively. All right, so acetabular or hip-cooled radiofrequency ablation technique. Um, this is a bit different, I will say, uh, because of the needle location and also some of the risks we'll talk about. Um, so this is a nice diagram of the vasculature and the, ne the nerves we're addressing. So um, we... Uh, a, a huge thanks to Leo Caparel for kind of figuring out, you know, categorically uh, where are our sensory nerves without us destroying or damaging any motor nerves. So we, they determined that uh, the obturator nerve, as it comes down medially along the obturator foramen, has branches that go into the acetabulum and the joint, which produce that prototypical groin pain you see with hip pain uh, or hip joint pain. Uh, similarly, you see branches of the femoral nerve, which also get into that acetabular ring, which really address sort of that anterior and lateral pain that patients can have. So the technique involves bringing a needle basically from here right up medial to the obturator foramen, or excuse me, lateral to the obturator foramen, and then creating two lesions along uh, this incisura, which is this aspect of bone, which is adjacent to the acetabulum, and then bringing another needle and bringing it to the 12 o'clock position of the acetabulum to address the femoral nerve. So um, the biggest thing to avoid, as you can probably obviously see, is this nice femoral artery. So I will start out by doing ultrasound, or at the very least, palpating the femoral artery, because we don't want to put a 17-gauge diamond tip needle right through a femoral artery. So um, this is a little bit uncomfortable for patients because you're pretty close to their privates. Um, and so you really want to warn them this is going to be a little bit uh, of a loss of your modesty. And you want to mark out everything very well, femoral crease, inguinal crease, the femoral artery they've marked out well. So even before you're, you're getting your fluoro and you're lining everything up, you really want to mark all this out and really get a good understanding of where your needle insertion should be. Uh, if you want to use ultrasound to really ensure that your needle bypasses the artery, that's not a bad idea. But generally, once I mark it out and I understand where I am, I get deep to the artery, and then I start marching up towards the obturator nerve. Um, just like any procedure, 
uh, make sure you use sterile technique, uh, et cetera. So the first thing we do fluoroscopically is make sure there's symmetry uh, between the two obturator foramina, and then periscope laterally to the uh, hip you are targeting. And as you can see here, we have a nice view of the acetabulum. You can see here, there's a little bit of a glare. The incisura is right here. So we want one needle tip location to be right here, inferior to the incisura, and another superior to the incisura. This incisura is really coming out at you, and uh, Mike and Matt will show you models of the pelvis. You guys have that pelvis model with you? I need you. Oops, did I put you on the spot? <laughs> okay. So there, we'll, we'll show you a pelvis model where you can really, it's in the lab, perfect. Uh, yeah, I don't need it right now, but really take a look at this and see what we're doing. Because under flora, it looks like, oh, I just go here and then I go. But you actually have to backtrack and bring your needle more shallowly to walk up and over the incisura uh, because there are branches of the obturator that can, that can really get you there. So here's another image with needle in place. Again, everything's nicely marked out. Um, what they're doing here is a diagnostic block. Again, that 12 o'clock position of the acetabulum there. And here we're seeing the cooled radio frequency technique. So now we're using the 17 gauge. Again, it doesn't really matter if you're coming like so or like so. There can be some leeway here as long as your target point is where the radio opaque marker of the probe is right at the 12 o'clock position. Um, here, what we're going to do is come in inferiorly, touch down on the inferior ramus, and then walk our way up. Incisor is right here. So I want one lesion point inferior and one superior. And so here's a better look at that obturator pathway. So basically your runway is right here in the yellow, uh, incisora there. So what I will do is I will walk right onto OS. A lot of the patients that were referred to me had BMIs well over 30. Uh, so you really wouldn't know your depth until you walked down and touched OS. So I will touch us, they will jump or scream a little bit, inject local, come back shallow, and then start working your way uh, superiorly. It is a disconcerting procedure for patients, warn them of that. It feels weird because you're coming, uh, you know, from the proximal thigh, a needle is basically coming into their pelvis. So really warn them and, and assure them uh, about everything you're doing. You don't want to use too much local prematurely, like blocking those nerves before you get to where you want to be. But certainly be generous with the local anesthetic. Um, both the genicular and the acetabular cooled radio frequency procedures, uh, they're generally very uncomfortable while you're doing them. Patients will scream, move, and swear. When you're done, they are super happy and satisfied. So you go through this roller coaster. You really want to warn your patients about that. Um, so we'll, we'll keep on advancing the 17 gauge. This person probably hit us there and then started continuing to advance. And here are the two lesion locations, again, above that incisor and below. Um, super important to do motor testing here. Uh, I have had obturator motor uh, stimulation. Uh, so you, if you see that happen, it probably means you're too medial and you really need to come back towards the acetabulum. Okay. Um, generally with that 12 o'clock position, that superior location of the femoral articular branch, I have yet to see motor stimulation from that. <clears throat> Any questions about the hip before I take the last five minutes to talk about the SI joint? Clear? Totally clear? All right. Have you guys done any hip cooled radio frequency ablations? All right. Can be very rewarding. All right, and now the sacred iliac joint. This will be fairly brief since we just have a few minutes. And so you might have used other companies as well. One of the advantages of having cooled radio frequency is now you have a larger lesion size. So all those lateral branches uh, coming out of S1 through 3 can now be addressed as they go towards the sacred iliac joint. The other important lesion is that L5 dorsal ramus right here. So in total, you're doing nine lesions. Uh, but that doesn't mean you're just sitting there doing one lesion, waiting two and a half minutes, and then walking down and doing nine, you know, spending forever. What you generally do is uh, you put in three needles with the three probes, lesion, it might 
be in sequence, then lift them all up, angle them inferior, lesion, lift them all up, and angle superior and lesion. So it doesn't have to be the most time-consuming procedure on the planet, um, depending on how you organize things. So um, as mentioned here, uh, we have the L5 dorsal ramus uh, addressed here with the sacral ala uh, and the superior articular process there. Um, you can do multiple lesions if necessary. Uh, this is often a, a nerve that is a major player in one's sacroiliac joint pain, which I alluded to in that sacral stimulation patient. Uh, and then for the S1, S2, and even the third neural foramen, we generally do three lesions for S1 and 2, and then you only need to address the superior and lateral quadrant of S3. You, don't, you do not need to do an inferior lesion here. And this picture nicely demonstrates uh, the lesion if you do those three in that uh, pattern. It's one of the things that they used to have in our kits was this epsilon ring. What it did is it helped identify your uh, lesion locations so that you weren't too spread apart or you weren't too close together. Um, I don't even think we have those anymore in our kits. You can buy them, but you can just sort of measure things out and ensure that you have the right distance. Just remember, five millimeter radius. Five millimeters there, five millimeters there. So generally one centimeter between your needles, okay? And you have the option of doing every other stimulation with these machines. You can do bipolar, uh, pulsed, uh, traditional. So this is a nice image reflecting um, the zones where you want to be. Once you find the neural frame in which they've highlighted with these copper rings, you don't want to be too close. You don't want to be within seven millimeters. You want because otherwise you might start uh, denervating or neuralizing uh, the S1 nerve root if it's tucking around. You want to be in this green zone right here, about that seven to ten millimeter mark. And if you are too far lateral, then you're if you I mean there wouldn't be anything wrong with that because you could address those sacral nerves or the lateral branches. But then you'd have to do multiple lesions if you're that far out. So that sweet spot is generally in that seven to 10 millimeter range. Uh, and you can see each of the arcs uh, for S2 and for S3. Any questions about that? As far as literature, um, it's been very strong in favor for cooled radio frequency ablation of the sacred iliac joint. Um, this pain physician article in 2015 reviewed all the interventions for sacroiliac joint uh, pain and found that the best evidence is cool rate of frequency of these lateral branches, level 1A evidence. Uh, Mike and I met an individual who really didn't feel like it was helpful in their practice. And everyone's entitled to believe what they want to believe based on their uh, results. Uh, but for me personally, it's been very useful. Uh, I particularly use it in individuals where steroid burden is a concern. Uh, so if, if you have a patient who is coming in every three months and they're doing well with their sacroiliac joint intraarticular injections, this can be a huge help. Now, it doesn't mean they always get 100% relief. Maybe they get a little bit less, but if you can buy more time uh, between that steroid burden, uh, that's a huge win. Yes? Well, then you're doing a medial branch neurotomy. So then you, you could be addressing some referred pain down in the sacroiliac joint, but you're really addressing a, a different issue. And you can do medial branch all the way up the spine, cervical, I mean, with cool RF. The difference in technique is, is there a spine here? Rather than tucking over the transverse process over the <clears throat> AP, like you saw from Dr. DePinto, like with traditional, your needle is like so. Uh, with cooled RF, you actually abut it right into the junction of the transverse process to I or SAP here without wrapping it around and over because you're going to have distal projection of your lesion. So your angles are slightly different, but basically all you do is bring your needle right down onto the os and then you lesion. Whereas with traditional RF, which you, which you saw with Dr. DePinto, you usually get into that groove, you then turn your needle a little bit lateral, superior, wrap around, and then get a little bit forward, then motor test to make sure you're not uh, getting any motor stimulation from the nerve root as it exits. So there's a little bit more finesse with traditional, whereas with cooled RF or the medial branch, 
you're just walking it down and lesioning because the os is protecting you from getting into the neural foramen.